So I'm Jackie Pick, and I am the Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer at the NCPA, National Center for Policy Analysis in Dallas. And you might know me as Jackie Daly. I have another name at the Jackie Daly Show. So I actually do a show on Glenn Beck's The Blaze, all about oil and gas. Um, but I'm here today to moderate this panel of fine folks. And before I get started, just want to say that I was here yesterday and just reflecting on how important these issues are and thinking that this might be the most impressive gathering of experts, really, that I've seen anywhere. I mean, congrats to TPPF. I go to lots of these conferences, oil and gas conferences, think tank conferences. This is perhaps the best I've ever seen. So, please, yeah. And I'm really honored to be a part of it. So, uh, listen, th this theme of this panel is different because we're talking about mandates. We're talking about fiats. Uh, those things that our government and a world government if it could, uh, would push on to us to remedy a problem that is very much in dispute, as we have learned over the past couple of days. So what we know is that this agenda can only be accomplished through mandates. It could not be done through the US Congress, for example, by the people's representatives. There's no way. I just came from there. I worked there for seven years. Uh, that would not fly on Capitol Hill. <laughs> we can be thankful for that. But you know that what the mandates we're talking about up here, the Clean Power Plan and whatever happens in Paris, will have an outcome that will be all about uh, eroding sovereignty, eroding individual rights, redistributing wealth, redistributing power, and most likely, even by their own admission, it will not address the problem they claim to be concerned about. So we all should have, you know, be asking ourselves, what is going on here? What is the agenda? What are the means, the tools, the methods, the laws that these leaders will use, uh, perhaps against our will, to bring about this change? And the people on the panel who you hear from today, they might be the top experts uh, to really parse the details of what is about to happen uh, here domestically and internationally that we need to be concerned about. And of course, why should we be concerned? Because the future will not look like the past at all. If these things do come to pass, and we all have the ability here uh, to, to use the podiums, uh, the forums, the talents we've been given, the opportunities we have to take what we hear today and push it out uh, to the public and to the influencers, because I'm not at all uh, convinced that the right questions have been posed in the minds of the public. It's not at all clear that our universities are teaching the kids to think clearly and critically to ask the right questions. So we need to reframe the debate, I think. And that's what it's all about today, and that's the purpose of this panel. So we're going to start uh, with Mr. Nasi here to my immediate uh, left. He's a partner at Jackson Walker. He practices environmental and energy law. He counsels for rural electric cooperatives electric generation interests and ongoing EPA proceedings and appeals pending before the federal courts and the Supreme Court of the United States. He's a member of the TCEQ Pollution Control Property Tax Exemption Advisory Committee, that's a mouthful, uh, and vice chairman of the Central Texas Salvation Army, immediate past chairman of the state bar of the Texas Environmental and Natural Resources Law Section recently awarded the Energy and Environmental Trailblazer Award from the National Law Journal, that's kind of a big deal, and he has his BA from the University of Texas at Austin and a JD from the University of Houston Law Center. So please help me welcome Mr. Nasi to the podium. Well, thank you. I will, uh, I will be the scary environmental lawyer on this panel, but I will endeavor to do what so many of you do a great job of, and certainly this organization and its affiliates, in trying to give you some information to be able to communicate um, with our friends, family, and neighbors in a way about something that is literally 2,000 pages in the Federal Register. So I'm going to try to do that in, in the very limited time we have. This is a slide that I would normally present and talk about if I had a bunch of people in the room um, that you know wanted to talk about the technical details. It basically tells a story that, that takes 20 minutes to talk about. But how many people here own a power plant? How many people own a car? Okay, let's talk about cars. 
All right. So, so the way I like to, and I, this is a technique, I don't know if it works, you can be the judge of that, is if you want to know about the clean power plan and how it works and its technical underpinning, um, it's a great to just think about it if it were actually a standard that applied to cars. And so what, what the EPA has done is articulated simultaneously in both and a 111B as in boy rule and a 111D as in dog rule that new power plants have to have an MPG standard. They have to be a certain amount of efficiency. It can only emit so many pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour of generation. And so I would analogize that to obviously a new car MPG requirement for, for an automobile. And at the same time, they, in that same rulemaking, in this case, the 111B is in boy rule, they've said, you know, if you have an existing power plant that you kind of rebuild or reconstruct, we know that that standard is too stringent. So um, the new standard would be 1400, which by the way is way too stringent, but let's just say it was fair. Um, but they've said, you know, actually 1800 is really more of a realistic number of uh, pounds per megawatt hour um, to, to impose. And yet at the same time, Literally at the same time, they have proposed a nationwide standard that if you are an existing power plant and not modifying your facility, you are governed by a standard of 1305. If you're in a state or electricity market that actually has a lot of stuff that you could use instead of what you're doing, then the number's even lower in Texas, it's 1042. And that's very akin to literally telling the American people that here's the new standard for cars. And we would recognize that there's no catalytic converter to make your GHG emissions lower. So really the standard's more like 40. But at the same time, you all have to get your existing cars to meet 70. And if you live in a state that's got a lot of public participation, maybe it's 80. And oh, by the way, the 2011 Prius you bought doesn't count. Because that's what happened in this rule. You basically ratcheted things down and all the renewable energy and anything you've done to diversify your fleet in Texas is a great example of that, don't count. It is by all measures a totally unsupportable regime. And what I'm going to try to talk about briefly is what does it do um, um, in terms of legal risk to not just the people who run power plants for a living. My clients deliver electricity, generate it. Some of them mine the, the, the stuff that gets us to uh, generate that electricity or produce the gas that does it, OK? Um, but one of the most important things I get asked to brief people about is what is next if EPA gets away with this, okay? The fundamental underpinning in the Clean Air Act, which is a very lengthy document, okay, is basically a, about 100 words EPA is extracting this entire incredible energy reforming, e economy changing rule from, and it's the, they're, they're saying that they can uh, regulate the electric grid as a system of emission reduction. For the 40 years of Clean Air Act and the 24 years I've been doing Clean Air Act work, we have always defined, and the courts and every administration, DNR, has always defined those systems to be inside the fence. Because the way you solve environmental problems, if you have them, I'm not sure we have one here, that's a different question, but come with me into the world that we actually have a problem that requires CO2 reduction. Um, you go at the site, you go inside the fence and you address it. And, it. and it is on that basis that the constitutional deal was cut between the American people and the government that we would allow uh, an environmental agency like EPA to make calls about what is able to be done inside that fence at a plant, okay? That's what system meant. EPA in this case is doing something they have never even attempted before and I believe will ultimately be struck down, but it will take too long and too much resource to make happen. And that is they have defined system to be the electric grid. So it doesn't matter that your power plant can't make the standard even if it was you know, even if you spent a billion dollars on it. It doesn't matter to them because they're saying you can, what you need to do is shut down what you own and pay somebody else who's a part of that system. It's an amazing thing. And so let me tell you what that means legally. If system of emission reduction can be the electric grid, why couldn't it be the pipeline system? And one of the most important things that I think activated a lot of folks in this room starting maybe a year and 18 months ago, and I've met with many of you about, about this, including in Midland, is this precedent is a very dangerous one because let me tell you what the world looks like if they get away with this rule in oil and gas and maybe even in the transportation system. This is not a far stretch uh, of a legal interpretation. If you know, we talk about blocks in the clean power plant, all you need to know is that block one is what you can do at the plant. Block two is something a little bit cleaner that you might be able to switch to outside your fence. 
And then block three is a bunch of renewable stuff you might buy to, to make the world feel better about itself. Well, in, in oil and gas, the, the, the parallels are, are pretty clear. If EPA can assert jurisdiction over a grid, it can assert jurisdiction over a pipeline system. And it can say, you know, cleaner crude based refining, green completion based ENP, that's actually going to be preferred. That's where our oil and gas needs to come from first. If you aren't meeting certain GHG standards, then you're going to have to pay other facilities that are, that are a little bit cleaner. So incredible manipulation of the energy market's potential. But then you careen into the rabbit hole, which is block three. If we can force a, a, a power plant owner who, who spent you know, a couple billion dollars on a power plant and, and, and tell him that even though there's no way you can fit this, meet this rule inside the fence, if you can force him to close and strand all that asset and then go have to pay for wind to be built, then what, why, why couldn't we do that to refining and tell them to build a biofuel refiner? Okay, and I will tell you as a lawyer, there is no difference. Okay, because if a system of emission reduction is a grid, it can be a pipeline. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to give you a sense of how this rule has evolved from proposal to final. Not much interest in, in talking about wonky details, so I'm going to fly through some slides. These are all available. The main intent of including them is they'll be a resource to you. Um, TPPF will make them available. These are a series of slides that, that, that tell you on a, on a couple of different bases which states are carrying which uh, burdens. This slide doesn't mean as much as the subsequent ones because this is just as a percentage of reduction, how much are states having to reduce. Under the proposed rule, there was vast disparity. EPA magically figured out a methodology that made there be a lot less disparity on a percentage basis from proposal to final. On a, on a rate basis, which is really what matters because if you get a rate and you have to make that standard, um, you, you're going to have to reduce tons hundreds, thousands, millions of tons of carbon dioxide. And it controls issues like how much stuff must you build? How many assets must you strand? So rate basis is a much more important um, issue because in energy, everyone here knows, scale matters. So it's not really so much about how much of a percent reduction you have, it's how much stuff do you have to do? And under that basis, Texas has a little bit of a problem, okay? Um, Texas is a big state and it carries a massive burden under this rule. Under the proposed rule, and then under the final rule, a lot of coal intensive states were significantly impacted in the final rule in an adverse way. Red means the standard got worse for you, got more stringent, okay? And then EPA did something remarkable. Because you know, if you're making stuff up and violating the Clean Air Act, why not stop it the, 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 the short term? Let's go ahead and just make up a whole new system. So they created a mass-based way of looking at it. And on a mass basis, they played with the numbers and they, under the final rule, basically drop Texas's requirement almost in half. Because what they're trying to do is, is incent people to participate in cap and trade mass-based programs. It's like, it's, 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 it's voluntary. States have their own control. Kind of like if I tell my son whether he wants to eat a bowl of ice cream or a bowl of peas, okay? Um, you know, I think I know what he's going to choose, right? And so this, the, the, this coerce, the coercive federalism, you know, we have this concept in Clean Air Act law called cooperative federalism, where we, we cooperate between the state and the federal government. This is the best example of coercive federalism. This is the federal government saying, I'm going to give you a horrific rule, but I'm going to make it so sweet for you if you just capitulate. And it is sad to see a lot of our brethren in other parts of the country are biting off on that lure, and it is a scary thing. Um, so, let's move quickly. Um, this is the overall burden carried in the country. Hard to read this slide. Texas is the big, big chunk, proposed rule, and then the final rule, okay? Look at these slides later if you wanna see where the winners and losers are under this rule, okay? Um, this is a, a reminder uh, uh, for people who actually can't be convinced that, that CO2 reductions are not something we should be prioritizing. If you just look at the nation's current CO2 emission rate, um, pounding states like Texas, for example, that already have a below average emission rate and a very diverse mix of energy resources, and oh, by the way, produce the majority of the fuel chemicals and manufactured goods for the country, maybe we should have been an example as opposed to be the most burdened. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, not a surprise, probably. And then it gets really scary. This graph builds up the renewable build-out assumptions that EPA has made. Each of these colors represent 
different renewable energy sources. And you know, you might look at that slide because of the scale and say, well, that's not that much increase in hydro concentrating solar, geothermal and solar and PV solar. But actually, it's because we had to squeeze the scale because compared to the percentage increases and magnitude of the wind build out, they look small. Those numbers on the bottom part of the chart are actually scary and unbelievable. The wind numbers are literally mind blowing. Uh, sorry, that was too easy. And, and, uh, and, and uh, Brian Lloyd will be much more capable of talking about some of the consequences of that on our grid. But let me go to a couple of high points that I'm sure he would want me to at least point out at, at first. I'm gonna go to this slide. Scale matters in energy. The renewable build out that EPA has assumed, okay, in Texas alone, is more wind and solar than currently exist in the world in any one nation. The wind and solar build out that EPA assumes over the entire nation is more than the world has altogether now. Has six times more than, our, than any one nation. So we hear a lot of talk about this is gonna happen anyway, this is gonna happen anyway. It's an amazing thing, is it? Okay, scale matters. How many billions of, trans, of cost, how many you know, hundreds of thousands of miles of transmission. It's a remarkable thing for them to say. And this is the, this is the topic, no doubt, that Brian will hit as well. This is, a, this is the first 11 days of August. And this tells you the light blue is how much installed capacity we have of wind. The dark blue is what was actually available at peak that, uh, and during the hottest times of the year. And the red is, is every, the red and the light blue is, is all the other stuff that made up for when the wind wasn't blowing. Okay? And we're talking about a rule that would functionally tell over half of that red bar, you're done, okay? Your assets are stranded, everybody else has to socialize and pay for that. And then the other half, you're gonna tell, you need to stay in the market and be there when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining. So we're all gonna have to pay them to do that. The cost implications of this rule are impossible to get your arms around. We've had a couple studies come out. I'm not gonna throw a bunch of numbers at. You'll see that information, TPPF will get that out. But trust me in knowing this. There isn't a single analysis that has been done to date, even as scary as the numbers are, that factor in all of those costs I just flagged for you. The stranded costs being socialized, the, the balancing power and ancillary services, and then transmission, which is something Brian will probably talk about. And just as a closing thought, in case you were wondering whether the press was neutral, take Bloomberg, for example, okay? Bloomberg put a study out, a story out, you might have all read this, this is within the last week, where they told the story, it's so terrible for coal because coal's in a windy state, and wind is you know, single-handedly taking out coal. That was the whole theme of the story. And, and they had this graph, and it says, look at coal and how wind is displacing coal, and it was just this compelling thing. Well, look at the amazing thing they did. They collapsed the units on the right-hand side. When you actually separate the units, these are not the same resource. They're not even correlately related. I mean, I mean, Brian can tell you what market dynamics do. When the wind blows and they're subsidized, it affects every other resource. It, it hurts gas more than anybody, okay? But, but the idea that there's somehow a displacement, this story that was spun, just an amazing misrepresentation of data. But that's the kind of thing we deal with every day. And then I'll sit down. All pain, no gain. You heard the congressman talk about it. This slide, please go to it. Um, look at the data. This has the most up-to-date information about economic impact, the pain, and then the lack of a gain. The graph on the right shows you, using EPA's own methodologies, what the concentration of CO2 impact will be of this rule relative to the global concentration, and then what you heard the statistics already quoted. It's a hundredth of a degree Fahrenheit difference using EPA's own model. And in case you were wondering, as we careen into Paris, okay, with all the economic destruction of this rule, in 2025 alone, and it'll get worse after that, all of the reductions of this rule in, in the year 2025 mm -hmm. offset in three weeks in China. So with that, I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Mr. Nasi. There you are. So next up is Mark Morano. He's the executive director and chief correspondent of climatedepot.com and communications director at CFACT. He previously served as a senior advisor, speechwriter, and climate researcher for one of my favorites, U.S. Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, 
and comms director for the Senate EPW Committee. Uh, his work is well known. He has appearances on CNN, The O'Reilly Factor, BBC TV, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Wall Street Journal. He's the winner of the Accuracy in Media Journalism Award and was inducted into the Town Hall of Fame. Welcome, Mr. Morano. Thank you very much. I have a lot to cover here. We're going to go from uh, uh, America, D.C., and Paris, ultimately, and talk a little bit about the basic premise is, can the weather be controlled? And what, what is happening in Washington? What kind of claims are we hearing? First off, December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. Well, a new day that will live in infamy. The global warming uh, movie, Climate Hustle, will premiere at a Paris theater. I just got word this morning that we are actually overbooked for the December 7th red carpet movie event. We are, we are hundreds of, of people capacity, and the theater is now completely uh, overbooked. So we have to actually have limited standing room only for this premiere. The film will reveal which animal was used as a mascot for global cooling in the 1970s and the same animal used as a mascot for global warming in the, in, in the, in the current day. Uh, in other words, when it was cooling, the animal migrated south to get warmth, and when it was warming, the anim animal's now migrating north to get cool. Uh, and they're basically, both claims were made with a straight face of this animal. Who am I? As James Stockdale said, someone mentioned him yesterday, Ross Pro's running mate. Uh, I am a, well, I won't say that, but that was a ClimateGate professor in a BBC Live interview who, uh, you know, that was probably a more polite word than denier. I was in the film Merchants of Doubt. Don't confuse this with Climate Hustle. Climate Hustle is the film uh, that I'm in. This is the movie that I was interviewed for. It's a global warming activist film done by the people who did Al Gore's film, Participant Media. And I was attacked. And here are some of the reviews from that. I was portrayed as the villain. And these are quotes from, these are from the LA Times, New York, uh, New York Post. Terrifyingly impressive, sadistic, magnificent er uh, anti-hero. The Washington Post, the star of the film, a jocular, weirdly unapologetic advocate for what can only be called ignorance, meaning a skeptic. I'm not a scientist, but I, I, but I play one on TV. That was the line that the movie used in the trailer. They called me sick, scary, loathsome mercenary, evil nemesis, a grinning skull nihilist. That was my favorite one. So, and all I did was talk about being a global warming skeptic. So here we were talking, I think it was uh, Walt Cunningham was talking about the public and how we're, we're not getting through. I, and, and it depends on which polls you look at, how the question's asked. But I consider Gallup being the gold standard. They don't have an agenda when it comes to this. And the way to look at this is not whether people believe in global warming or whether they, you know, whether they accept or reject. It's whether they're afraid of it. Because uh, as Richard Lindzen was pointing out yesterday, you know, whether people have, man has an influence or not, how big it is, it's all a matter of scale. 2015, Gallup global warming didn't even make the list for the top issues facing the country. And now in previous years, it usually came in at number 14, number 15. This year didn't even make the list. Gallup also found global warming at its lowest level of concern. And that is the key thing. There are people worried about it, they concerned. Since 1989, it's the same level of concern as before the UN panel, as before all the Nobel, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning reports, before Al Gore's film. In the 1980s, no one was even thinking about global warming. The Amazon rainforest was the big issue. We're at the same level of concern. Most shockingly, Gallup found, and this again, last March, global warming ranks at the bottom of environmental concerns. And that's the shocking stat. If you look at it there, pollution of uh, drinking water, forest uh, extinction, uh, deforestation, all rank higher than global warming. It's the dead last among environmental issues. We've won an important battle there. And I get to the end, I'll tell you how, what's sad about this is we may be losing the political battle because of President Obama's willingness to bypass Congress. Let's just talk about a little of the shenanigans. Right now we had Lamar Smith here this morning talking about the, the pause busting study. What pause? That's a book about the commissar vanishes under Joseph Stalin's uh, Soviet Union. When commissars were in, out of favor with the Soviet leadership, they would be airbrushed out of photos. And that's essentially the same level of what we're finding out here, not just on the global warming pause. This was a pause that they've tried to, first of all, deny it existed. And then about five years ago, the UN chief admitted that it existed. And then they also, at the previous times, they tried to get rid of the medieval warm period as well. And there's the actual pause, 18 years, nine months. This is the latest data just posted about two weeks ago on Climate Depot. Uh, this was from the RSS satellite feed. This is the longest record. It's a record expansion of the global warming pause. So they denied it. They admitted it. And my favorite 
uh, one sec here, is this. In the UK government, a UK energy minister actually took credit for, for uh, uh, climate policies, green policies, for causing the global warming pause. So at one point, they stopped denying it and they were saying, hey, look, it's working. All these climate regulations we're doing, it's working. We're slowing down the Earth's temperature. And they actually said, you know, warming may have decreased, which, sup which support the effectiveness of green policies. Now, they have 66 excuses for the global warming pause. This is before they got rid of it. What's interesting about that is in 1974, there were literally 60 theories that had been advanced to explain the global cooling period. So we had global cooling, and by the way, global cooling was the same metric. They, it, it obviously existed, it had showed up in National Academy of Science and NASA, it showed up in CIA reports, showed up by top scientists at the time. Now new studies are claiming the global warming claims never existed, that that was all a myth. We had 60 theories to explain it, they say now it doesn't exist. We have 66 theories to explain the global warming pause, now they say that doesn't exist. And of course, what are they smoking when they claim that green policies do that? Okay, does the global warming science even matter? I'm heading off to Paris in a few weeks. The EU Climate Commissioner on record as saying, even if we're wrong on science, we're doing the right thing by policy. And that basically sums up this whole movement. They don't really care whether we're facing catastrophe. They care that they can motivate politics to support their policies. If the science some decades says we were wrong, why would, would it not in any case have been good to do many of the things we're doing, which is essentially planning an energy economy? What is it all about? If it's not about science, what is it? UN uh, Vice Chair uh, Edenhofer, Otto von Edenhofer, actually said in 2000, we will redistribute the world's wealth by climate policy. Now, is Bob Murray in the room by any chance? Because he, he's not, but he predicted, he said, obviously the owners of coal and oil will not be enthusiastic about this. I was going to ask Bob if he was enthusiastic about it. But this is what it's about. They had to free themselves from the illusion that climate policy is environmental policy. This isn't a skeptic saying it. These are the people implementing the policy at the UN IPCC, admitting that climate policy has nothing to do with the environment, that it's about wealth redistribution. Another agenda. What kind of claims are we hearing? In Washington, we're hearing about poisoned weather. What in the world's poisoned weather? A tornado. Oh my gosh, Houston had a flood. That's fossil-fueled poisoned weather. This is what, according to uh, Brad Johnson, a global warming activist, oh, wrong button. This is the new phrase coming out of Washington. Not just extreme weather, poison weather. Global warming now is even impacting the dead, according to our mainstream media. Siger Siberian corpses are, could ooze contagious viruses as their graves thaw out. That's not all. We may need UN treaties and carbon taxes to save the mummy. Climate change causing mummies to turn to black ooze. The, the burial sites have higher humidity due to climate change. So not only are we affecting your children, future generations, you're affecting past generations unless we deal with this. <laughs> and and it, it's actually a racial issue. Bill McKibben, we've all heard of him. White America has fallen short by voting for climate deniers. Paul C uh, Krugman, New York Times columnist, burn in hell. Those who deny global warming, quote, this is, quote, on the pages of the New York Times, not in an off-the-cuff speech or a radio interview. He said this in the pages of the New York Times. May you be punished in the afterlife for doing so, denying global warming. He called denial, quote, an almost inconceivable sin, unquote. So you're harming the dead. You're harming future generations. You're, uh, um, if you're white, you've fallen short by voting for deniers. And you're, uh, you're going to be punished in the afterlife for your views. What are some of the signs? In 1933, we're talking about poison weather, the, the government in Syria banned yo-yos because they thought it caused droughts. Now they want to ban SUVs, coal plants, because they think it causes droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. Peace professor Michael Clare, this is Hampshire College. This is how apocalyptic they've come. Let me see if I can get all this. This is one actual quote that he wrote in Salon Magazine, a mainstream publication. This is some of the fantasies of doomsday. Quote, we envision, <coughs> we envision rising temperatures, prolonged droughts, freakish storms, hellish wildfires, rising sea levels, food rights, mass starvation, state collapse, mass migrations, conflicts of every sort up to and including full-scale war could prove even more disruptive, deadly, persistent drought, hunger forced millions of people to abandon their traditional lands and flee to the squalor of shantytown. <laughs> that is what people are being taught by peace professors at college. Nancy Pelosi, our, our former uh, House Speaker, declared every aspect of our lives must be subjected to an inventory in order to combat global warming. New York Times, Tom Friedman, lauded China. One party rule can just impose politically difficult 
but critically important policies to move society, society forward. To hell with democracy. NASA's, I call him NASA's ex-con, the former lead scientist of global warming, because he's been arrested about half a dozen times protesting Keystone Pipeline because of the global warming alleged impacts. He endorsed a book, and you can still find this on Amazon.com, the review, called For Ridding the World of Industrial Civilization. Uh, NASA's lead global warming scientist declared the author had it right, the system is the problem. The book that NASA's lead global warming scientist endorsed proposed raising cities to the ground, blowing up dams, and switching off the greenhouse gas machine. Hmm, scientists aren't just neutral observers, are they? And that's what Einstein thought. <laughs> hey, if we can affect the dead, we can bring back the dead to comment on uh, James Hansen. UN climate chiefs want this centralized transformation taking place. And she said it's going to be a, a make life on the planet different for everyone. Now, does that sound exciting? China's doing the right thing. They, you know, not only the New York Times, hey, the UN's got to get on it. They've lauded China's one-party rule. This is the UN chief. China is able to implement policies because they avoid the legislative hurdles. Jeez, don't you hate legislative hurdles when you want to get something done? Uh, shrink humans. You don't like it. You're going, to the, you're going to hell. You're already condemned to the afterlife, according to the New York Times. Well, how about human engineering? This he's featured in Climate Hustle. Genetically engineering humans with, with drugs to increase your altruism, shrink your height to reduce your um, carbon footprint. This is not made up. We have the video of this guy going on and on in the film. The UN Climate Summit, it's not actually a climate summit, it's a peace summit. New Yorker just this week, actually two days ago, why a climate deal is the best hope for peace. Global warming, now they're trying to say global warming caused terrorism, caused the rise of ISIS because of the drought in Syria, despite the fact that droughts aren't increasing. In 19, global warming caused terrorism before, but before that, global cooling caused terrorism. And there's the article, this is via real website. The CIA warned that it was bringing drought, famine, and political unrest if the global cooling continued. Carbon-based energy is the moral choice. It's one of the greatest liberators of mankind in the history of our planet. It's always Earth Hour in North Korea. That's the South Korea on the bottom. We're all North Koreans now. We're heading that way at this UN treaty. The era of constant electricity at home is ending, the UK power chief has, war has warned. Families would have to get used to using power only when it was available. There's the article. This is incredible. They're now telling, de not the developed, developing world, but the developed world is regressing to the point where we just can't. You want to use your washing machine? Oh, sorry, not between the hours of 10 and 4. You got to use it non-peak. It's unbelievable this is where we're heading because of these fears. John Holdren, Obama's science advisor, revealed the real energy agenda. 1975, the real threat is cheap energy. Quote, the U.S. is threatened far more by the hazards of too much energy too soon than by the hazards of too little energy too late. They told us what they were up to years ago. Recession is planned. Uh, I interviewed this man at a UN climate summit. He's a big global warming scientist. He shows up. He's part of the UN. He advocates planned recessions. He's personally cut back on daily. He doesn't shower daily. He doesn't change his clothes. He's in my film as well. He tells the UN uh, climate we have to give up our obsession of economic growth. Uh, warmest Professor Alice larkin Bull. she just spoke at the TED conference sponsored by Bill Gates. Economic growth needs to be exchanged for, quote, planned austerity. And they're calling, again, planned recessions. It's called degrowth strategies. Vaclav Klaus said it best. He lived under communism. The ob this ideology wants to replace free and spontaneous evolution of mankind by essential planning, global planning. He's, he's warned about it. So with that, we have the EPA regulations coming. Uh, and, I, and I'd be happy to talk in Q&A about where the Republicans are failing and how this has to be done. But if we did face a crisis and we had to rely on the EPA and UN, we would all be doomed uh, because nothing they propose would have any impact on the climate that you could measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morano. Next up is Raymond Gifford. He is a partner at Wilkson Parker Nower, where he counsels companies on state and federal aspects of regulation. He previously served as president of the nonprofit think tank, the Progress and Freedom Foundation. He was chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission and first assistant attorney general for regulatory law in the Colorado Attorney General's office. He clerked for the Honorable Richard Match uh, in the Federal District Court, District of Colorado, and he is an adjunct professor at the University of Colorado Law School, chairman of the university's Silicon Flatirons Program for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, Welcome, Mr. Gifford. Thanks. Um, I have uh, 
been on panels with self-proclaimed socialists. I've been on panels with anarcho-capitalists. And Mark, this is the first panel I've been on with a grinning skull nihilist. So um, I, I feel like I've uh, accomplished something already. Um, it, it's been a great two days uh, in part because uh, it, uh, particularly folks like Mike and I kind of bathe daily uh, in a set of presumptions uh, that are uh, progressive era in nature. And to hear the spirit of Schumpeter and dynamism, to hear about Julian Simon and abundance and Hayekian distributed entrepreneurial information is something that Mike and I really don't hear about at all. We, we live in the world of Louis Brandeis, Woodrow Wilson, and the administrative state that we have inherited, uh, and particularly uh, their great heir uh, today, Gina McCarthy, who's the uh, administrator of the EPA. What I want to talk about is, I think, hopefully complementary to what Mike's talking about and what Brian is going to talk about as well, which is where does this clean power plan end up? What does it look like? Uh, and what are states going to do? And uh, I wish I could bring a message of optimism. I think I may bring a message of qualified pessimism uh, because the administrative slate state uh, grinds uh, in slow motion toward uh, prescribing uh, carbon reductions in this country, and to stop it is going to be take an act of political will uh, that is going to be extraordinary and extraordinarily difficult. Well, Mike started to talk about how the uh, clean power plan works, and pointed out that it is a cooperative federalist model under the Clean Air Act, where each state, uh, through uh, as Mike alluded to, a, a preposterously fanciful method, uh, is given a carbon budget. And through that carbon budget, they must, by 2030, achieve something over a little bit of 30% reduction in carbon dioxide output. And this, as you see from this chart, depends very much um, on the type of generation mix your state brought in the first place. And from the proposed rule to the final rule, the EPA did two iterations, what they figured out in the final rule is uh, that how to stick it to coal-centric states. And after all, that's the point of the clean power plan, is to squeeze coal out of the nation's generation mix. Uh, and by the way, for the, those natural gas enthusiasts, uh, don't worry, you're next on the menu. So first thing that the... EPA does is hands each state a carbon budget. And it gets very complex and it gets uh, you know, very difficult uh, to describe how they derived it. But Mike really pointed out how they did is they assume massive increases in renewable energy. Uh, they imagine an increase of renewable energy year over year at the single highest level of capacity additions from 2010 to 2015, and then they take that and compound it year over year, and out of that, your, your state's carbon budget comes. So you're a state official. That's what I was at one point. There are state environmental directors, state utility commissioners, and what you're being told right now is you have three years, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, to come up with a plan to us, the EPA, where you can show us how an, an enforceable, verifiable plan is going to result in these carbon reductions. And it doesn't matter if you don't buy the legal side of it. It doesn't matter if uh, you think this is, is all a hoax. You as a state official have to do this. Otherwise, the federal government will impose its own plan on you. The second point that I would make about this is why states are moving and have to move, is the time scale in utility planning is not one or two year time scales, it's five, seven, and 10 year time scales. So if the EPA says as they do that by 2022 you have to meet an interim carbon reduction goal, you as an electric generation owner, you as a state official, need to decide today not in three years, not in five years. You need to decide today 
that you are going to bring down that coal plant. You are going to build those new renewables. And that, again, is part of the legal audacity of the EPA's move, which uh, Mike described a little bit. I would submit that the legal audacity of the EPA's move, and given the nature of the utility industry, from the EPA's perspective, is a feature, not a bug. Because what you're doing is you're forcing the whole-scale re-engineering and transformation of the U.S. utility industry on a time frame that's going to happen in large part before the legal appeals play out. So what does EPA uh, think we're going to end up doing? The EPA believes that it is reasonable to anticipate that a virtually nationwide emissions trading market for compliance will emerge and that ERCs will be effectively available. Those are credits to any affected electric generation unit wherever located as long as its state plan authorizes emission trading among affected EGUs. So here is what EPA is saying that the states are going to do. Uh, and along with Mike's kid, whose choice is between peas and ice cream, uh, where the state's inducements are. The state, what they're saying is we will go to a nationwide allocation trading platform. In other words, we are going to cap carbon emissions and we are going to trade those carbon emission allocations. You may have heard that that failed in the Congress, but if you have an EPA's progressive mindset, you have figured out the audacious legal method to get nationwide cap and trade through the means of an obscure provision of the Clean Air Act 111D. That is what EPA expects. That is where EPA has set the incentives for states to come in and offer a plan that does nationwide cap and trade. So what's the time frame and why should we be even more depressed? So the EPA says uh, it's going, it's uh, issued the final clean power plan this August. By next September, states are required to submit an extension request. EPA has made it very clear that extension request is going to be easy to get and I would assume that every state that's included under the auspices of this rule will seek that extension, uh, no matter how much they hate the rule and no matter how uh, difficult, like Texas is, their, their uh, obligation may be. Within three years, the state has to submit its final plan. And in that final plan, they have to say what they're going to do. What they're going to do in EPA's uh, expectation is submit a plan that authorizes nationwide allocation trading. In seven years, you have the interim goal, and I talked about the utility time frame, and this is why it's difficult. To meet that interim goal when the compliance period begins, you're going to have to start from a resource planning standpoint, from a state planning standpoint, uh, to make those decisions as to which plants do you retire, which plants do you keep on? What new things do you build? So on and so forth. That starts in 2022. And in 15 years, that's when you get to meet your resource planning goal. Now let me match up this timeline with the legal challenge to, to the rule. The challenges, as everyone knows, have already been filed. There is a petition for stay from the states that are challenging the rule. That petition is to the D.C. Circuit. It essentially says this thing is so illegal and is going to cause us to do so many bad things immediately. If you don't stay at D.C. Circuit, uh, irreparable harm will happen. Now, to most in the room, if you explain that we're going to have to take billions of dollars of assets uh, and... Uh, and decide what we're going to do with them, that seems like you should get a stay, right? I mean, that, that doesn't seem hard. The reliance interests are going to be very heavy. Um, however, this D.C. Circuit, as many of you know, has been effectively packed by this administration. The Senate got rid of the filibuster for one reason and one reason only. That was to put four new judges on the D.C. Circuit. 
Uh, seven of the 11 judges on the D.C. Circuit are either appointees of the Obama administration or the Clinton administration. I would expect, and the appellate lawyers in Washington that I know, uh, expect the same thing, that barring that we draw an inside straight of judicial rule of law judges, uh, it's going to be a tough slog in the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit upholds this plan, uh, you go to the Supreme Court. You're in the Supreme, the D.C. Circuit rules on the stay this fall or this winter. They rule on the plan eventually next November. Then we go to the Supreme Court. We're at 2018 at the earliest. You'll notice at the same time, that's the same time the state plans are due. The state plans being due, what's that mean? States are going to move toward creating and enabling emissions trading platforms. It's happening under our noses right now. Regional environmental think tanks are bringing enormous resources to bear. It's really good to have Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer on your side because you have boundless resources to bring states together and evangelize your preferred trading platform. So what happens in the end here? In the end, I think EPA believes that even if it loses, it wins a lot. Because the decisions uh, and the paths that states are being forced to take, that utilities are being forced to take, that electric generation owners are being forced to take, those decisions are going to be front-loaded, the legal determinations are going to be back-loaded, and with that, I hope I have not depressed you too much, but the, po the, the bottom line point is that short of a political reaction to this rule, not a legal reaction, not a regulatory reaction, uh, this rule is going to start remaking the nation's electric system along a high cost, high renewable model that those of you who've ever been to California or Germany uh, should know and love already. So thank you. Up next is Brian Lloyd. He's with the Public Utility Commission here in Texas. He's executive director since December 1, 2010. Previously, he worked at the PUC for more than 10 years, spearheading agency projects and working as director of oversight of the retail electric industry. He was the primary author of several agency reports to the legislature and testified before legislative committees and the FERC, that's Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the PUC. Prior to joining PUC as executive director, he served as director of budget, planning and policy for Governor Rick Perry, and was a key contributor to the Texas State Energy Plan. Welcome, Brian Lloyd. Well, thank you, Jackie. This is a, um, this is a tough panel to go last on, because I'm going to, similar to a cleanup hitter, probably just kind of tap, tap some of the points home. Whenever I go around both Texas and the country talking about electricity and as it relates to Texas, I always start with, with two slides because it's, it's, it's important to talk about what we have in Texas. If, if you go on the U.S. Census uh, Bureau's website, what you can do is find this map. And what that shows is the geographic center of population from every census. So beginning of the country starts on the East Coast, and as you've had the Western migration, that has moved all the way down to the most recent census, and, and it's now sort of somewhere in Missouri, I, I, I added in a trend line. <laughs> and so for those of us from Texas, this just confirms what we know is that we are the center of the universe <laughs> and are exacting a gravitational pull on, on the rest of the country. But, but when it comes to, to what we do at the PUC and what we care about here in Texas, I mean, this is important. We, we are in a remarkable time, and we talk a lot, and I know this foundation does a great job talking about the great Texas um, success story, but it's in a historic period of migration. And, and Texas is the current area where people are migrating to for opportunity. And unfortunately, and I don't know if Chuck DeVore is here, but when they come from places like California, they don't bring power plants with them. Okay, so, um, and, and as we all know, electricity really is the lifeblood of the modern economy. And whether we're talking about the petrochemical industry on the Gulf Coast, which is, which is undergoing a revitalization and a new renaissance, or we're talking about 
data centers in Central and North Texas, or we're talking about oil and gas development in, in South Texas and, and, and the Permian Basin, they are tremendously reliant on electricity, and it is the single largest cost input for many of them. And, and we in Texas, because we, we like having economic growth, have really focused what, what are we going to do as electricity regulators or, or, or for electricity policy around making electricity reliable and affordable? And that has been the single driving goal of Texas policy, certainly as long as I've been at, at, at the PUC and in my other, other capacities. So, you know, we're about the only electricity grid at this point in the country that actually has this thing called demand growth. Because everywhere else has really just frankly, shed industry to other parts of the country. There were, some of you who were in the manufacturing world, during the recession, there were companies that, that operated manufacturing plants, both in Texas and around the world. We talked some about Germany and other places. And, and they made decisions to keep the plant in Texas open because they couldn't buy electricity anywhere else in the world for cheaper than what our world-class leading competitive market um, has provided for them. So, so we get pretty sensitive at the PUC when we have federal regulations that sort of threaten kind of what we've done and, and threaten our power supply. We were with the cross-state air pollution rule, we were with the mercury and air toxics rule, and, and we certainly are with um, the clean power plan. Um, it, it's been interesting as this topic has come up, I've been on more and more panels, not with other electricity regulators, but with environmental regulators. And, and I will tell you sort of as a matter of course, the, the ones that I've visited with, they're all terrified of this rule for all the reasons that Mike and Ray and, and, and others have talked about, because it's not, it's not fundamentally environmental policy. And they know that. This is not, you know, hey, here's the piece of equipment you can put on a plant to reduce this pollutant and with the traditional pollutants of NOx and SO2 and those things. And we can have arguments about what levels of those are really dangerous and all, but there's, there's a thing you can do at the plant to get less of that out. That's not what this rule does, as, as Mike said. What this rule does, the, the, the primary emissions control that they are looking for in the plant is to not run your power plant anymore. And as Mike said, either go pay to build something else that is lower emitting or pay somebody else to, to, to do it for them. So we, um, you know, I know Governor Paxton's here yesterday. We have worked closely with the TCEQ, um, Governor Abbott's office, the Attorney General's office on, on all of these rules. We provided a 50-page declaration in support of the stay motion um, that, that was talked about. And, and really, you know, as I talk about this, what, what I tell people is we're not really sure whether the EPA knows the potential catastrophes they're creating and don't care about it, or they really have no idea what they're doing with relation to what energy markets are. I actually think it's the latter, and I think that is much, much more terrifying than, than the first one, because you can go through and you can read the rule, and it's just... For those of us versed in electricity markets, it just doesn't sort of match up with, with the way the world works. So I, I would say to summarize the PUC's view, I would say that we believe the rule is legally unsupportable. It is appalling in its shredding of states' rights. It is disturbingly breathtaking in the scope of the powers being claimed that, that, that Mike talked about. It is devoid of an understanding of how electricity markets actually work, and it is dangerously cavalier about reliability. And if my commissioners, or I'm sure Governor Abbott were here, they would not have sugarcoated it the way that I just did. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, to get Texas specific, you know, it's, it's important to know when we talk about the electricity market in Texas, we really actually have to talk about four markets. We talk a lot about our ERCOT power grid. We are unique in the country. We're because our primary power grid is wholly within the state. There is no federal jurisdiction over virtually any of it. We, the PUC, are the sole regulator in the country that regulates both the wholesale market and the retail market. In every other state, Long-standing Supreme Court decisions are that states are the primary and, and frankly the only regulator of retail electricity service and of decisions about what power plants you're going you're gonna to have your utilities build for your consumers. The federal government in the sector is, only has jurisdiction on interstate transmission and on wholesale sales across state lines. And so we are very unique here in Texas. We guard the jurisdiction of the ERCOT power grid jealously. And for those of you involved in, in legislative um, session issues, we, we had actually discussions this session about how we make sure that we don't lose that jurisdiction. It is what has let us create, again, the world's most competitive both wholesale and retail market in the world. It has led to prices that, again, are the envy of, of, of other states and other countries. There was some talk earlier this morning about what Germany and, and some folks in Asia. We, we routinely have regulators and, and power industry executives from those countries come. In, in the last visit I had with, with the chief economist from one of the uh, uh, German utilities, he sort of, you know, he kind of went through all the things you guys I know have heard about, and, and he got done and he looked at me and I said, well, I'm sorry, I think you're screwed. Um, 
because for, for all the reasons that Ray talked about, you can't unwind these kind of decisions once they're made because you've either shut down plants or you've integrated a lot of um, um, resources into your grid with subsidies that you then just can't really easily back out of. Um, so in Texas, what we do is this weird thing where we have allowed the competitive forces of supply and demand to really be the driver for the resource decisions. We at the PUC within the ERCOT region, we don't tell utilities what kind of power plant you can build and where. You have to make that assessment as an investor and you have to make that assessment of what you think will work. And again, the result of that has been the lowest prices in the world. Um, that is fundamentally opposed to sort of what the EPA then is here trying to do really as the nation's central planner of electricity. And that is where, frankly, we, do, we just, you know, our brains sort of lock up when we try to read this rule and think about the implications on a competitive marketplace. And, and at the end of it, you know, Mike and, and Ray had, had good discussions on mass-based versus rate-based versus trading plans and everything else. That's all noise around what the fundamental issue is, which is the federal government saying to Texas and other states, you know, we think you got it wrong. You set up your system to get the cheapest power available for customers, and we don't really like that answer. So we're going to make you change your system to get to our answer, which is really geared not on price but on emissions. Um, Mike had some of these. I'm going to run through them pretty, pretty quickly. The, the rule sort of has this fundamental premise that all sources of electricity are always substitutable everywhere, and that is simply not the case. With this, um, these are going to be all be electricity nerdy, wonky charts, so I apologize in advance for that. But what you should take from this one is this is, again, one of our weeks in August when people in Texas like to be cool inside with air conditioning. The green line that goes up and down there is demand on that day. And demand swings on a, on a hot summer week about 30,000 megawatts from the middle of the night to the middle of the day, about 50% increase. The blue line there is wind power production in that week. And you will see those things kind of don't match up very well. And in fact, that 6,000 megawatt swing in wind power, the wind tends to come up as the demand comes down, and the wind goes down when the demand comes up. Okay. Wind has a role in, in, in our market. A lot of it has been subsidized by, by federal policy and, and would not be here but for that. If investors want to make those choices and put that power on the grid, that's fine. But when the power is not there when it is most economically valuable, um, you can sort of see the impact of that. This is sort of a, this is another one. This is actual wind output as a percentage of the total installed wind capacity in the state. This is August the 26th. So the top there is 100% of our wind capacity. We're at 12, 13,000 megawatts this past summer. You can see the middle, time, the middle there is the middle of the day. And when it starts to get really hot, you can see that the wind production really is at its minimum there. And so it is not as simple as replacing coal plants in East Texas with more wind farms. We can put as many wind farms in the state as you want, but when they're running at about 2% capacity, that doesn't really sort of solve our problem. We'll do this one here. On 111D in, uh, specifically, ERCOT, who's our, our primary grid operator in the state, did a study, updated their study on the proposed rule. Um, 4,000 to 4,700 megawatts of additional coal retirements caused solely by this plan. And, and the important thing about that study, and, and this gets to the compliance deadlines, is, is it's not in a vacuum of just the clean power plan. There is still mercury and air toxics. I saw two days ago that the EPA has done a new version of the cross-state air pollution rule, which, which for many people, for many states, is going to be much more draconian. And the issue that we pointed out very directly to the court in our stay motion is you've now got this problem where coal plant owners that have all these other regulations trying to, to deal with whether it's mercury, whether it's sulfur, uh, ozone, other issues, those require investments in power plants. And if I own that coal plant and I look now at this rule and say, in 2020, you're telling me I can't run that plant nearly as much as I do today. And so my cash flow is going to be a whole lot different than without that rule. Am I going to spend a couple hundred million dollars on those emissions controls, knowing that down the road they're going to be stranded and things like that? So we're, at the PUC, we're not worried about reliability issues in 2022. We're worried about reliability issues next year as those plant owners have to make those decisions and they decide, I can't have my shareholders um, bear those costs. And that, that is what the rule fundamentally does not get. The EPA talks a lot about reliability safety valves. So if in 2024 you have something that means you've got to run a coal plant more, well, that's all well and good, but those plants have been shut down for eight years. And you can't just restart them because the workers are gone, the plant is closed, and the mines are gone. Um, Details of what 4,000 megawatts means to our grid. This is August 10th when we hit our record peak demand in ERCOT. Again, the main one to look at is the dotted red lines. 
What that number basically is is how much spare capacity we had on the grid, because on this day, everything that's not broken is running to keep those lights on and keep those air conditioners humming. And you can see at the peak, we were down to about 3,500 megawatts. You take 4,000 off of that, all of a sudden you've got a pretty big supply and demand balance problem. And, and the, the studies that we and ERCOT have done, last year without 4,000 megawatts, we would have been in emergency conditions, including rolling blackouts in some of seven days during the summer. And that only gets worse because, again, we have this unique thing called load growth here in Texas. So we have to add power plants every year just to keep up. I'm going to kind of zip through, through the end here. Um, we sort of talked about reliability. The transmission plan has kind of been hit. Price increases, the ERCOT study, the 44% incre increase in wholesale power prices and 18% increase in retail prices, not counting things like additional transmission, which we will need, additional backup and, and, and things to keep power plants online. Um, as Mike said, we lead the nation in wind power. None of that counts. It's a bit problematic for us. And I'm going to end on this. The, the, this is, um, again, when we get to what has motivated Texas, this is average retail price in 2014. The blue line bar there at the beginning is the United States. The other bars until you get to the dark green one are states with cap and trade systems. And they have made their choice. And states should be free to make their choice about what is most important to them. And those states have made their choice and, and you can see the impact on their price and what we've done here in Texas. And I will close with this. The last time the EPA uh, required the power to be shut off, that's what happened. <laughs> so with luck, Mike and General Paxton, um, we'll be able to cross the streams and, uh, and, and, and get us something instead. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd. And with that, we're going to open it up for about 12 minutes of Q&A. So who would like to kick us off? Yes, sir. between your panel and the last and, and yesterday as well. Um, energy prices go way up. Energy availability, reliability, including potentially brownouts, blackouts, et cetera, and the, <coughs> the reliability goes down, all to address a problem that doesn't even exist. Um, Mr. Gifford, I mean, you were asking if, if about, or you are commenting about people being depressed. Um, now, I can assure you, I'm, as you might be able to tell, I'm not depressed. I'm enraged. And what I'm wondering is where are the checks and balances, and specifically, we have a Republican-controlled Congress. What should they be doing about this right now to just cut this whole thing off at the knees and say, no, this is not going to happen. It is just not acceptable, period. Uh, well, one thing I might tell you is that so it's pending. A lot <laughs> really have to make this a issue in the campaign. I was, uh, when you hear Donald Trump or other candidates just say, oh, you know, global, one time Donald Trump was asked about it at a rally, and he said, who here cares about global warming? Uh, let's move on, next question. Well, whether you believe in it, not believe in it, you still have to address the fact that President Obama has bypassed Congress. In part of my presentation, I mentioned the polling data. Well, Beyond that, politically, we won the battle of global warming. Cap and trade failed in 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009, 10. It was never even put in for a vote in the final vote in the Senate. Uh, we never had carbon taxes. We never ratified UN treaties. So politically, we were able to stop it all. The problem is, and this is where President Obama is more, I guess, powerful than did LBJ. He's gone to, he's now at the level of FDR in terms of transforming America. By bypassing Congress, doing the EPA executive orders, and they're not executive action, because that makes him sound like a man of action. These are orders, executive order. These EPA regs essentially are going to put de facto climate regulations that the American people in Congress has repeatedly reject, rejected. Now, if the next president, if the lawsuits fail, the next president is, is, continues this policy, we're looking at four, eight more years with these in place. It's kind of like, you know, Obamacare, where they tried to repeal it. Well, you know, now that's probably part. When, once government expands and central planning goes, it's very hard to ever roll it back. So you ask what they should do. They need to seriously talk about defunding the EPA. They need to seriously make this a, <coughs> a tier one issue where the whole election is going to be about price and reliability. This microphone's not working. I was part of those delegations every year going to these UN summits during the Bush administration and they were, you know, the Bush administration played all along and legitimized, funded the UN science at the same time, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you know, George W. Bush is, is not pursuing this. Well, he, 
He set the stage for Obama, and now, well, now we're facing a UN agreement without Senate ratification. So we're having domestic climate legislation bypassed, international climate legislation bypassed, and all despite the fact the public is with the skeptics and we've won all these battles politically. It's just he's transforming America. He truly is. He's not an incompetent president. He knows what he's doing. Uh, well, and I would add, um, the next three years, the game's in the states, right? The, the states have to make decisions about what, uh, if anything, they're going to submit to the EPA uh, in 2018. I, I think every state should prudently seek that extension next year. But um, after that, um, I, I think the EPA can plausibly impose a federal plan on four or five recalcitrant states. If there are 30 states uh, who, who push back, uh, it, it's a different matter. But, but, it, but it's, it's a political matter primarily. It's not a regulatory law matter, and, and it's not, I think, going to be that effective of an appellate law matter. Do any of the other panelists have any thoughts? No? Okay. Yes, sir. A, a two-second aside, I'm not saying this to impress you, but I was a senator in Illinois for a lot of years, and a judge said to us, you need to let somewhere between four and 6,000 prisoners out of your jails, because I don't like your jails. We said, up yours. We're not releasing them. He said, if you don't, you're going to bump, bump, bump. And we said, up yours. We're not doing it. Well, after four up years, as he finally figured out we were not going to let them out, and we worked out something that, you know, eventually worked out that we were fine with. What happened to elected officials who weren't eunuchs? I mean, at some point you have to pretend that, that you have a mandate because you were elected. Your point of 30 governors, if we could get 30 governors to say up yours, we would stand. Uh, is there anyone trying to get the governor's organ, like the Republican Governor's Conference? I mean, is there anyone trying to say to him, you know, if you say no and just say no, after a while, you just keep saying no and there's nothing they can do. What are you going to do, call out the National Guard to force us to do it? So we'll send the Texas Rangers. I mean, I just, I don't understand this total inability to just say no. Who would like to address that? Yeah, I mean, I think the sentiment is absolutely the correct one, and I think we have a core group of states that really do feel that way and have spoken that, about that. I mean, I'll, I'll keep my remarks limited to the people I deal with daily. Um, the governor and our former AG, Governor Abbott, um, has been about as strident as anybody could hope uh, and, and strong. Uh, the, so, I mean, we have, a, we have a Gonzales flag in Texas. Um, it says, come and take it. Um, I, I've talked aside. Uh, I have made a T-shirt. Anybody wants one? Um, it's an interesting thing for a lawyer to do. But I mean, the, 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 the legal question of, of whether we could actually stop them if it all, you know, all hell broke loose is a fascinating one. It's one that I've, you know, I've actually encouraged DPPF to go actually try to find out what the answer to that is. But the real, I mean, what, what Ray said is so critical. The game is between now and when we would actually have that confrontation. Because what's happening is that under the auspices of being prudent, um, we've had a bunch of, of our, even our strongest allied states start thinking they need to develop a plan, a detailed plan as a contingency plan. And, and this is a little wonky and in the, in, and in the details, but it, one of the, I mean, we had a couple meetings, a meeting yesterday and a meeting here about getting organized, and a lot of folks are here, and this has been a great catalyst for this conversation, getting organized about getting the word out to the 27 states that are litigating and the brethren within that state, those states, about what is the absolute minimum amount that a state needs to do to get the extension that Ray talked about. Because what we don't want to have to do is fight off federal plans before the election. I mean, we cannot give, uh, we, we need to force EPA to basically take up and consider our ex extension requests that will be worded rather strongly um, in terms of us not supporting the rule, but we'll still check off the minimums. Uh, we need to get that done before the um, election, in my opinion. And so we need to start, you know, we, we, the battle lines we need to draw, unfortunately, are going to be kind of wonky and, 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 and technical between now and then, but ultimately that's the test. And you kind of have to, and, and, and I think the communication that groups like this and events like this are, are encouraging is going to lead to the kind of governor to governor, peer to peer discussion that needs to happen to figure out who that true uh, lion in the sand group is. Obviously, Senator, uh, you know, McConnell tried to initiate that conversation. What, what EPA did, again, a brilliant 
uh, centralized government agency now. Um, they change the rule, and it's a couple thousand pages of stuff, so it takes a, a while for people to figure out how they changed it. And what the, one thing they did change is they really had dropped a hammer on September of 16. Next September was going to be when that happened because we were gonna have to commit at that point. They lifted that commitment out of the rule in the final rule. They did it on purpose because they didn't want the stay motions to be granted and they didn't want to lose the political battle and they probably didn't want to have to confront that you know, line in the sand that they would then back up and say, I'm gonna draw a line around my circle and I'm not gonna leave. It's all Robin Williams joke. Um, but the, uh, I, I think that um, we, we, we all need to get armed with a better and sophisticated understanding of where are the opportunities to draw lines, okay? But not in a way that actually forces the states to get into a litigation about a federal plan before it needs to. As, as, as soft as that sounds, it is critical that we don't let them box us in. I mean, we, we have a real chance of, of winning this case, okay? I mean, Ray, Ray's right to be pessimistic lawyers. We're always pessimistic because we don't want to lower expectations. As an air lawyer who's involved in the case, I might be too close to the flame. But I do not believe this whole rule is going to make it, OK? So what we need to do is everything within our power to keep it from hitting in, getting into effect while we seek out justice. Um, if we have a Supreme Court uh, justice you know, drop dead and, 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 and this president gets to replace him, Check back with me about our odds, but right now, <laughs> but right now we are, um, you know, we've got four justices that'll let EPA do absolutely anything they want. Okay, I think we've got four justices that are going to hold them to some significant discipline, and we got a major swing vote to win. And, and with that, I'll shut up. Anyone else? No. Yes, ma'am. Do you see anything uh, uh, different from or more draconian? than this EPA uh, clean power plan coming out of um, Paris and whatever is anticipated to come out of that? Uh, well, Paris is probably, you know, even John Kerry, they're saying it's not going to be binding. It's probably going to be a lot of voluntary stuff. The problem with that is even though it's not, even if it's not compelled upon the U.S. with sanctions or anything, it's going to be a policy that the president, which makes the next election crucial, because if the next president supports the framework or whatever agreement that comes out of Paris, we're going to continue that through EPA and through other regulations to, to adhere to that, to do everything we can to continue to cripple our energy economy. And that's the whole problem. And just the point of that other thing, the reason Republicans especially are extra weak when it comes to environment and climate. If you go back to every Republican president since Richard Nixon, the most liberal, progressive, centrally planning-minded member of their cabinets have always been the EPA administrator. We know that because every former EPA administrator, Democrat, Republican, has endorsed President Obama's EPA climate rule. Republicans tend to think, we don't want to deal with this the environment issue. You know, I've got all these other priorities. I'll toss a bone to the other side. They usually get an establishment to progressive figure to run the EPA, and that's usually where all the havoc comes. And they don't want to deal with it. And I was on the Senate. When I worked in the Senate, we had major Republican senators whose staff would stand up in meetings when we were doing, debating, talking about cap and trade and say, we don't want, to, we don't want the senator um, talking about the science. We don't want to look like we're against the environment. We have to be very careful. We only want to talk about jobs. And so they're just timid and afraid. They're intimidated. And that's the whole problem, especially on the environment. They just, they're, they're not educated enough and they don't want to stand up on it. I, I think the bigger threat actually comes from the cocktail of EPA rules. The ozone rule, when combined with the Clean Power Plan, uh, you can effectively shut down oil and natural gas production and exploration over large swaths of the country, uh, which, of course, never mind the fact that the premise of the Clean Power Plan not costing much has to be 2 to $3 natural gas. Thank you very much. And we're out of time for Q&A. So I'll just close this out. These guys have done a great job telling us the what about how this works, how it's going to work. Thank you so much. Even more important, perhaps, is the why. Again, it's the erosion of sovereignty and individual rights. And these plans are going to harm the most vulnerable among us. It's going to be the fixed income seniors, the single moms, the people on a fixed budget. So thank you so much for your service. Appreciate it.